beloved one i hope you are doing well i want us to take a short reading from the book of psalms chapter 127 it says if god's grace doesn't help the builders they will labor in vain to build a house if god's mercy doesn't protect the city all the centuries will circle it in vain it's really a senseless to work so hard from morning till late at night toiling to make a living for fear of not having enough now god can provide i want you to see that it says god can provide for his devoted lovers even while they sleep now this tells us of the great things that we enjoy any time we come into God's presence. It tells us of the blessings we enjoy any time we are with God. And then we can do this through prayer, through the word of God, and even as we are about listening to that. So I want us to do something. We are going to like this video. So then please hit on the like button if you have not done so. This helps YouTube recommend this video out there to anyone so everyone can have access to it also by doing this you help in the spread of the gospel and of the good work of this channel then don't forget to leave a comment in that comment section hit on that subscribe button if you haven't done so and you are new here and then get on to the notification bell and do us the favor of tapping on it too you were blessed and stay blessed Hallelujah. 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 Thank you so very much for this wonderful opportunity. Bishop, thank you. Thank you. Honor to you and your wife. Thank you. Amen. Amen. I believe that God wants to do something mighty in our lives and in this place tonight. For the Bible says that he has not called the seed of Jacob to seek him in vain. Hallelujah. Yeah. And then the Bible also says that he is the rewarder. Not just of them that believe him, but of them that diligently seek him. I was touched when I got to know that there were people. I'm sure that some of them couldn't make it. But um, their hearts were still open to receive. I'm aware that there are so many people connecting across the globe. And it's an honor to bring his presence, his word, his power to us. The Bible says Jesus is the same yesterday. The same today. The same forever. I want you to please listen to me. When God wants to reach a people... He sends a man. When Satan wants to destroy a people, he sends a man. Either ways, is this better? Thank you. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Either ways, when God finds men or when Satan finds men, there will always be a reaction. Hallelujah. And so I truly believe that um, God has granted us the honor and the privilege to be here. Not just to project ourselves. No. Not just to project gifts and talents. No. Not just to project a celebrity life. No. The assignment that we have in this place is that for the sake of one person who has prayed, one person who has fasted, crying for a move of the Spirit, crying for revival, crying for an outpouring, for some of you, what you see today is a manifestation of your years of prayer, years of fasting, 
Hallelujah. We'll be seated shortly, but in Genesis chapter 28, the Bible tells us that Jacob came to a place called Luz, and he laid there to sleep at night, and then he had a vision, and he saw a ladder that connected the heavens and the earth. And the Bible says he saw angels ascending and descending. Angels do not move until they are sent. Yet Jacob never received anything. My question is, as they were ascending and descending, where were they going to? And who were they going to? Because we are sure that the man who saw them never received from them. He was a witness of their motion, but never a beneficiary. They left heaven to the earth, bringing messages, but not to Jacob. And Jacob said, the Lord was in this place, and I knew not. And I said that to say that just because you are here does not guarantee that you will receive. No, no. Many people were around the meetings of Jesus. Doubters, haters, passionate people. But in the midst of that crowd, the Bible records that a few people, like the woman with the issue of blood, if I may but touch. Being in his presence is not enough. I need to touch. And Jesus made a profound statement. He said, who touched me? Not who was around me. Not who heard me. But who? beyond just those who hear, beyond just those who register their presence, so I want you to lift your hands to the heavens and just ask the Lord to give you a visitation tonight. Go ahead. Following online, across the nations of the earth, if there's any overflows, and then for those of us who are here, my Bible says, for everyone that asketh, receive it. Go ahead. Ye have not because ye ask not. Father, give me an encounter in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Turn my life around. Let me encounter your wisdom and your spirit. Hallelujah. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for me. So I submit to his work in me till Christ be formed in me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard 
what God has prepared for me. So I submit to His work in me till Christ. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. Set our hearts on you so you will do what you do. We need a move. We need a move. One more time. We need a move. Spirit of the living God, we ask that you will help us tonight. Let there be an outpouring of the Spirit in this place. I pray that you set someone on fire. In the name of Jesus, shake the foundations of this city. And in the name of Jesus, we enthrone Christ afresh over this region, over this territory, and we decree and declare that every spiritual force that has hitherto fought the program of God, we prophesy, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted everlasting doors that the King of glory may come. It says, who is this King of glory? He's the Lord strong and mighty. He's the Lord mighty in battle. Come on, celebrate Jesus in this place tonight. Thank you, Jesus. May God bless you. Please be seated. Let your hearts be opened, be sensitive to that which the Holy Spirit is doing. The Bible says in Acts chapter 10, it says, While Peter yet spake these things, the Holy Ghost fell on all they that heard him. The difference between the ministry of the Spirit and an ordinary lecture is the presence and the move of the Spirit. Are we together? So that whilst the word is taught, what you are receiving is beyond just an intelligent information. Ezekiel chapter 2, 1 and 2, he says, He said unto me, Son of man, stand upon your feet and I will speak unto you. And he did not have the capacity to stand. Then verse 2 says, And the Spirit said, The Spirit entered into me when he spake, not before he spake. Whilst he was speaking, the Spirit of the word, entered into me i have a few thoughts that i want to share with us i believe in god's prophetic program across the nations i have studied the moves of god i have studied awakenings and revivals and i've been honored graciously honored by god to be a contributor to the move of god in many regards and um i know a bit about what happens when God invades a territory. And so whilst we had a wonderful time in the afternoon um, at Harvard, thanks to Prof and all those who made this happen, um, I trust that God wants to plant a fire. And truly, truly, if you found yourself tonight here, I want you to know that you are part of prophecy. There, there are certain meetings that those who come there don't just come. They think they just come, but it's a solemn assembly. It's a call by the Spirit. Do you believe that? And so I want you to please pay attention. There is an anointing already whilst I'm here. I'm sensing that there is a grace. And I want you to please listen. That whilst you are listening to me, something begins to happen to your spirit man. The 
Bible says, deep calls. Whilst you are hearing me speak, the revivalist that is locked up within your spirit for many years will finally find expression. The prophet, the apostle, the evangelist, I came to call something from within your spirit. God is not always doing the same thing in every season. Please listen. The character of God is such that even though he is almighty, he fragments his move and his programs according to seasons. Hallelujah. And so the Bible says of the sons of Issachar, Men who had understanding of the times, the Bible says, to know what Israel ought to do. God is not doing the same thing every time. No. You are not doing the same thing all the time. And you were created in his image. Is that true? So it, it is important that we understand God's emphasis. Am I loud enough for you to hear? Okay. It's important we understand God's emphasis per season and per time. Now, let me tell you, there are three levels of the anointing. This is just to introduce what I want to share. Wherever we stop, we can stop for tonight. But there are three levels of the anointing that the Bible teaches. Number one, there is the anointing that comes upon the believer on account of your union with Christ. That when you are grafted into Christ, there is a measure of his glory and grace and anointing that is credited to you. There are two people as I'm speaking now, I just saw light. The power of God resting on them. Two of you. The Lord is saying I should prophesy to you that you are stepping into a river. This is what I see. A river. It's a river in the spirit. It's a river of revival. God is restoring gifts. There are certain manifestations of the spirit you used to have, but for some reason, either carelessness, it looks like it's lost, like the hair of Samson. For someone, there is a restoration coming to you right now. Do you believe this? So, the first level of the anointing is that which comes upon an individual by reason of being grafted into Christ. The Bible says, ye have an anointing from the Holy One. Number two, the second level of the anointing is that which comes upon the believer when you find your place in prophecy and destiny. The anointing does not follow you, it follows your assignment. So for as long as you have found your place in God's prophetic program, that anointing comes in honor to your diligent pursuit of spiritual things. Are we together? Yes. That is the anointing that gives you a definition in life and destiny. So when you say Esther, you are not just calling a woman. You are describing a kind of anointing. When you say Gideon, you are not just calling a man. You are describing a kind of anointing. Are we together? But the third and final level of the anointing is that which comes to you on account of the sacrifice of alignment to discern God's prophetic program per season. This is beyond your office and is beyond just being a Christian. So it is possible that you can be a Christian and you can be a man of God or functioning in any area of call and yet not receive this third level of the anointing. That comes in honor to discernment and alignment, knowing what God is doing per season. You would think that God would use everybody in every season, but it doesn't happen that way. He rewards those that diligently seek him. But the question is, with what does he reward them? You need to know, how does God reward men? You see that now? So, that you are here tonight, 
Many of you are here as believers, commendable, wonderful. There's room for growth. Many of you are here on the strength of your place that you found in prophecy and destiny. But God has called for this solemn assembly so we discern what he's doing in Cambridge, in Boston, that there is a burden in the heart of the spirit and that there are people tonight and all through this conference who will say, Lord, I am available. Available. I don't just want to read history. I want to be an extension of history. So the things you read about this region, the things you read about the moves of God, as I, you know, had a little tour across the, the Harvard, you know, campus, and was struck as I looked at everything and I said, what God can do. But my challenge was, who will he find to continue his wonders? It's wonderful to celebrate monuments and celebrate the things past. But God is always looking for men who will be extensions of his possibilities. May he find you. Yeah. Did you hear that? May he find you. Yeah. May he find your children. Yeah. May he find your spouse. Yeah. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. Alright, so let's get to the word. Uh, I'll be sharing a few things with us. Number one. I began by saying God's emphasis, God is not doing the same thing all the time. So please listen. What is God's emphasis in these last days? The dispensation called the last days began when the spirit of God was poured upon all flesh. In Acts chapter 2, that began this final phase um, because from that moment on, it was called the dispensation of the spirit. And the Spirit has been given the unique mandate to oversee God's prophetic program until he returns. It is the Spirit of God who is called the Lord of the harvest. He is the one given the exclusive ministry of working with the saints to insist and ensure that God's program does not fail. That song, Yeshua, God bless you. So that's what we flow with, huh? Thank you. Are we together? There are three things. Please write. The emphasis of God over the nations, and that includes Boston, that includes Harvard, that includes everywhere you find men. There are three things that God seeks to do like never before. The meaning of this is that if you will ever find kingdom relevance in these last days, then you must be part of one, two, or all of these three. Those who will be relevant in these last days would have to go past the gates of just being educated, just being wealthy, just being intelligent. You would have to plunge yourself into God's prophetic program. Hallelujah. Emphasis number one, please write, is world evangelization. This is the first emphasis of the spirit in these last days, the global harvest, world evangelization, world evangelization. If you have ever gone to God in the place of prayer and said, Lord, what are you doing now? This is the answer. Number one, the global harvest. It's in prophecy that before Christ returns, there will be a move of the spirit like we have never seen. And the primary assignment, the intent behind that move is to draw many, many multitudes. Did you know that the earth, as we know, statistically speaking, has about 8 billion people thereabouts? And statistics tells us that there's about 2.6 to 2.8 billion people alone who are professing Christians. That means there is still a huge gap, a very huge gap as far as this global mandate. And you see, there has to be a strategy by the Spirit of God to sharpen this sickle so that we can do much within the time that is left. I want you to believe with me that we do not have all the time again. You don't have to be a Christian to believe this. You just have to be alive. The events on earth are clear pointers that the church age 
and the age of the earth as we know it is wrapping up. Are we together? And like never before, there is a cry of the Spirit. Like he, that lamentation that was raised in heaven, who shall we send and who shall go for us? So God's number one emphasis in this end time is world evangelization. Number two, are we learning already? The second emphasis of the Spirit, the second emphasis of God in this season and in this prophetic time is the maturity of the saints. The maturity of the saints. The maturity of the saints. So in addition to the global harvest, the Bible says an heir for as long as he's a child, he differeth not from a slave even though he be lord of all. I presume that a number of us here are parents. How many of you know that when you have a child, provided he's still a child, there is not much in terms of productivity and responsibility that can happen through that child? In as much as you love the child, you don't expect so much because he's still a child. What makes a child a child is not necessarily his size, but his level of development. Am I right on that? Yes. The characteristic feature of a child is not just the stuntedness in growth necessarily, but that there is a lot that that child needs to learn intellectually, mentally. That development has not happened. And so if you really want your child to become an adult, his size does not necessarily have to change, but there has to be growth and increase. Are we together? Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, the Bible says, And Jesus increased in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and men. That was how the baby became an adult, by increasing in wisdom, increasing in stature, increasing in favor with God and men. Can I tell you, the reason why many believers across territories are ineffective, and I submit to you, I'm speaking to a global audience even though we are here, so don't mind some of my expressions. I intend to get everyone who is following along. But uh, one major problem with the church is that believers have not been methodically mentored into a state of stature and maturity. So in as much as we have so many believers in church, God is unable to do much with us because he's limited by our level of transformation. It takes more than being available to be used by God. You must be transformed enough to host that which he wants to do. Are we together? So if you have a child of, say, four or five years, you're not going to carry your expensive vehicle, for instance, and give that child. You see that. The law enforcement agents will most likely penalize you for trusting this child with capacity beyond his ability. The Bible says he gave unto one five talent. He gave unto one two talent. The same God, the same love. But when it had to do with distributing responsibilities, he gave them according to their several abilities. Not according to his love for them. The same Lord is rich unto all but he could not trust them. You see, the end of that parable justifies his approach. That even the one with one talent deserved no talent at all. So the one talent was an act of mercy. Hmm. Are we together? Because that man was already lazy and then full of bitterness and offense. He didn't pay attention. It was clear that he did not deserve to be sent nor deployed. He was clearly not ready. Because even if he were given the ten, five talents, he would still behave the same way. There was no demonstration of capacity for increase in him. Are we together? And so there are many believers today who keep having dreams, they receive prophetic words about mighty and great things that God wants to do. But most people do not know that prophetic speakings and dreams and visions are at the mercy of the transformation of the believer. 
for their manifestation. No matter what God says about you, no matter what vision you have, no matter what prophecy or what prophet and apostle speaks over you, if you do not contend for transformation, there is a requisite level of transformation that can allow you host certain things that God is doing. So it looks like God lied. He did not lie. Your low level of transformation made his word look like a lie in your life. A prophecy was left over the nation of Israel through Abraham that they were to be in captivity for 400 years. Now, when you calculate historically and theologically, they spent 430 years. For many years, I kept asking, who added the 30 years? Because God does not lie. The 30 years was the extra period that was spent in training Moses until he became ready to be a deliverer. Every time you do not contend for transformation, you make those you are sent to think God does not care about them because their salvation will be at the mercy not just of God's intention to deliver or desire to deliver, but the mercy of your transformation. Are we together? So God's second emphasis is to release grace like never before upon the fivefold ministry so that we begin to methodically mature the saints. I submit to you that the average believer is bankrupt of knowledge and, and um, the kind of information that will bring such a person to maturity. Sample any two or three believers in any assembly for that matter, and their spiritual understanding with respect to the years they have spent in church, you will leave that place with pain in your heart. What do you know about prayer? What do you know about Jesus? What do you know about Satan? What do you know about failure? What do you know about, about success? What do you know about demonic activities? What do you know about the ministry of angels? What do you know about the advantage of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life? What do you know about, about um, victory in Christ? What do you know about purpose and destiny? Are we together? I'm probing you against the factors that make men powerful. What do you know? Now, you have been in church for many years. I agree and I respect that. But my question again is what do you know about prayer and its ability to empower the believer? What do you know about the anointing of the Holy Spirit? What do you know about the economic system of the kingdom? What do you know about kingdom advance? What do you know about the Great Commission? What do you know about hell? What do you know about God? Finally, what do you know about you? So, there is no, for many believers, we sing, sing hymns, we shout, we cry, and we keep recycling our ignorance. And, and that is the reason why God is not able to do much. And with all due respect, sometimes that campaign of ignorance starts with us preachers. Because we only sell to the people that which we know or that which we have. He said, such as I have. That means if I don't have it, I bring an empty tray. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. You don't have to be evil. So this is not about being good or bad. This is about not having the capacity to deliver to God's expectation. I can tell you if all the churches in America, in Africa, across Europe, if the men and the women of God were equipped intelligently to understand God's program and to methodically mentor the people God has brought within their care, there would be a ready army by now. A mighty army for the use of the king. I have always been concerned as a man of God as to why we have such available people every Sunday and every other day. And yet, 
you sieve through those people and find out there are very few. And most of those few, their transformation came by their personal press and their personal effort. Not necessarily a product of constructive mentorship. They decided on their own to look beyond the structures they were part of and began a personal press. And it ought not to be so. No. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15. Please give it to us. I want us to read it together if we see it projected for time. Let me quote it. It says, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart. You have that? What is the assignment? They will feed you with knowledge and understanding. I will give you. If it's a pastor that is according to my heart, his assignment is not to tell stories. His assignment is not to waste your time marketing self and personal achievements. The assignment of a shepherd mandated to raise God's people is to feed them with knowledge and understanding. So this is the second emphasis of the spirit. Can you imagine I've not even started teaching? This is just a preamble. Wherever we stop, if this is where we stop, um, no problem, we can... <laughs> Praise God. So just for you to know what God is doing, believers should not be in ignorance. You should be able to articulate with intelligence, justifying your spirituality. What is God doing? You've called him father. So how are you so in so much ignorance as to what he's doing? That tells me there's something wrong with that relationship. We advocate such closeness to God, yet we're in such ignorance as to what he's doing. <laughs> Am I right on that? You claim you're at the same table with me and they ask you, what do you think he's doing now? And you say, I don't have an idea. Come on. Even if it were dark, you should be able to intelligently say, maybe he's, he's enjoying a meal or he's taking a nap. And yet many believers who shout God as father and claim such intimacy with him cannot even articulate what is in his heart. And so I'm revealing to you now by the Spirit that if anyone should ask you what is God doing now, this is the answer. And this answer is not just based on my opinion, it's based on the authority of scriptures. Number one again, world evangelization, the global harvest. Number two, the maturity of the saints. And this is why I thank the leadership of this great church for allowing this um, platform to be able to minister to someone. This is our contribution towards achieving this second mandate. Number three, the third and final mandate of the Spirit in this end time is called territorial transformation. Territorial transformation. I think for the average believer, we are not apostolic in our approach of the Christian faith. So we limit our concept and idea of Christianity to just the personal benefit of your relationship. But the Bible calls us light. Did you ever read that? The Bible also calls us salt. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, I'll quote for sake of time. It says, ye are the salt of the earth. And then it says, if the salt has lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? He said it is good for nothing except to be trodden down and trampled on the foot of men. Then he says, you are the light of the world. He calls you a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a lamp, he says, and put it under a bushel, but that it is put on a candlestick and it gives light to all who are in the room. In that similitude, verse 15, 16 now says, let your light, the word let means permit, allow, do not withhold, do not restrain. Let your light so shine, not before spirits, not before angels. Let your light so shine in Boston. Let your light so shine in Cambridge. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Are we learning now? 
So this is the first point that I came to communicate tonight that God is not always doing the same thing and that it's important for us to understand God's prophetic emphasis. Global harvest, world evangelization, the maturity of the saints and the transformation of territories. When I talk about the transformation of territories, I'm not just talking about infrastructure and technology. That is the later part of transformation. Territorial transformation is the battle for the spirit and the mind of men. Territorial transformation is not just about having new buildings. That is only an effect. Are we together? Yes. Technological advancement, that is only an effect. In God's mind, territorial transformation happens to the degree to which the spirit and the minds of men are captured for the kingdom. You see, the gospel is twofold. The gospel is first a message that saves. Then the gospel is a value system that transforms territories. Hallelujah. The gospel, the message that saves, affects the individual personally. But the value system affects the territory. And let me tell you, an individual can be saved and yet your territory is not saved. Do you know that territories can also experience salvation? And if you are saved and your territory is not saved, you will still be in trouble. An example, Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot was a righteous man, but Sodom and Gomorrah was a dangerous place, and he was about to lose his daughters. Are we together? Lot went to Sodom, a good man, great man, but within a, a bedeviled society. And the result, if the angels did not step in, Lot would have died there. He would have lost his children. You would not see the potential of his personal salvation or his knowing God. Because the darkness within that territory literally covered his life. It's important that you are saved, but that your territory also experiences salvation. Hallelujah. Are we learning? Praise the name of the Lord. Do you like prayer in this place? Can we pray for one minute? <laughs> he spake a parable to the end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So right where you are, can you pray in the spirit just in one minute? And then we'll continue our discussion. Shabala. Barandos cabrande gele baratosia baratose. Mighty God, give you praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, please write this down if you're writing. There is a way that God designed men to know him and to function. There is a way that God designed for men to know him and to function. The believer is not given the liberty of inventing your strategy as far as the knowledge of God is concerned. There is already a defined pathway to knowing God. And if you ever attempt knowing God through any other route, you are going to meet a lot of excesses. It will corrupt your knowledge of God. Are we together? The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16 to stand in the way and to ask for the ancient path. That old path, are we together? And says that when you find it, you should walk therein and you will find rest. And so many believers try to know God using their creativity. Creativity is only relevant when we talk about dominion, not intimacy. When you are talking about intimacy, what you need is alignment and surrender, not creativity. The value of creativity comes when you become a king. A priest does not need creativity because the, the ordinances of priesthood are defined. 
What you need is to obey. But when you now become a king, you need all the creativity to manifest the God life within your environment. Are we together? So I said that just to emphasize that there is a way God designed for men to know him. And within the time that we have, I want to give you an apostolic blueprint. The journey of the believer. How did God design for men to learn him? How did God design for men to grow spiritually? Because for many believers, they say, I love the Lord, but I'm at a loss as to how to grow effectively, productively. God wants to answer that question now. Hallelujah. So there is a way God designed for men to know him. The early church believers in the book of Acts particularly, they had a very powerful apostolic model. It was like a software. If you brought the believer and passed that believer through that system, he would become a mighty person. I had the honor of going around and speaking at your prestigious Harvard. Do you know why Harvard is Harvard? It is not the building. It is not even the men because they come and go. Those who started it are not there again. Yet the excellence still remains. The standard still remains. You know why? Because there is a modus operandi. There is a pathway. So you pick a student, any kind of student from any nation. You are allowed to come. But when you come, you must be prepared to pass through a system without altering the formula. You see that now? What makes Harvard, Harvard is the dexterity and the insistence of that formula. If you corrupt that formula, you will no longer have a Harvard graduate. So I can guarantee that a first year student in his or her naivety and ignorance who just arrives Boston, I can guarantee that in five years, in six years, this student will be an exceptional person in whatever field of study. The basis of my confidence is the system he's about to pass through. Are we together? This is how it is in the kingdom. God did not design for people to just become arbitrarily. That means if I see a believer in Boston and another believer in Texas, another believer in Ghana, another believer in UK, another believer in Asia, they should look the same. If they pass through the same system, the disparity in the quality of believers is a corruption of the formulas being applied. Are we together? So if I have a believer coming from Africa and he's found wanting on many grounds, a believer in America, and yet we all call ourselves believers. When, when, when you see someone who is a professor of medicine, say here, you have many medical colleges here. Do you know that two professors can actually meet the first time in a theater and not doubt their abilities? Because the system that accredited them is trustworthy. That if someone stands and says, I'm a professor, you don't doubt his proficiency. Not with the system that accredited him. But today when another person says, I'm a Christian, you will have to say, hold on, let me vet because I'm not sure. Where are you coming from first? <laughs> are we learning? So the problem is not necessarily the believer. The problem is the system. The formula has been tampered with. And through the ages, because the formula has lost its texture, the kinds of believers produced are a testament, an attestation to the fact that something is wrong. I want to show you the formula now. Are you ready? Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Thank you, Jesus. I like Boston. Thank you for your attentiveness. <laughs> Are we together? Listen. 
if this model is followed, it sustains within it the power to turn any believer from infancy to maturity, granting you capacity to represent the purposes of God to his satisfaction. Are we together? Your lecturers do not speak the same way. They do not look the same. Are we together? Even their approach to you, you know, in study and learning is different. Yet the results are the same. Because the manual is greater than the lecturer. The lecturer is as strong as the information that builds him or her. Are we together? It was their compliance that evolved them from a student to now a professor. That is how it is in the spirit. If you learn what I'm showing you, if I never meet you again, I can guarantee by the integrity of scripture and the ministry of the spirit that I just left a wonder evolving. Hallelujah. So Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, the Bible says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. Acts chapter 6 and verse 4, please. The Bible says, but we will give ourselves continually, continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Can we read it one more time? But we will give ourselves continually uh -huh, to prayer and the ministry of the word. So Jesus began to sample ordinary men. Some were fishermen, some were business people, some were naive and confused people. And he brought a team together, leaving them an assurance that he would make them fishers of men. Clearly, they didn't have an idea of the gravity of that training, nor the mandates that he followed. Are we together? They were all interested in winning political positions because when they saw the invincibility of Jesus, they believed he would conquer Herod, he would conquer Caesar, and find a place of honor politically. So their coming to Jesus was not necessarily because they loved him. They hoped that they would share in the spoil. That was why they were angry when it looked like he was not saying anything. You get the point now? One by one, they started complaining. Look, we've left all to follow you, and we do not understand your, you're not saying anything about... Um, and Jesus looked at them, at their ignorance, and at everything. It's the reason why Jesus, when Jesus gave himself to die, they ran away. They felt cheated. They felt wounded. They felt we just wasted three and a half years of our lives claiming to be a mentor. We followed you, hoping we would have great destinies. Now you gave yourself to die, leaving us a lot of trouble with Romans. You caused trouble in crusades, shouted at people. And now you want to go to heaven. They said you're not going anywhere. You get the idea? So th they are refusing him to go to heaven was not because they were going to miss him. You can't ferment trouble and then leave the scene and leave us alone. No, Peter said, you're, you're, not, you can't, you're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. So when Jesus gave himself and died, they were disappointed. They were heartbroken. And in John chapter 21, Peter was angry and he said, I go a fishing. Let me return back to my profession. And the disciples said, we go with you. You get the story now? So, to save you disappointment, because many believers have been in this thing called Christianity for a while. And they are getting tired and frustrated right now. Because it looks like a journey going nowhere with no definition. And they are tired of lying to themselves. And now they are trying to be true to themselves and say, you know what? It's been 10 years of supposedly wasting my time. Lying that I'm hearing God now is clear. I don't hear him. Lying that I want to make progress and nothing is moving in my life. And let me tell you this. If we do not restore this model... Many Christians will be the ones who fight Christianity. Not unbelievers. Many angry, frustrated Christians will arise and say, you know what? I've been in this religion thing for a while. It did not work. 
there is a generation right now that is frowning. I, you know, sometimes I feel for the generation, what age do I put down? Let's say 20 or so. Am I, is that a fair number? 20 downwards? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. If we do not restore this model, if they do not see the value and the profit of spirituality and the pursuit of godliness, hear me, it will be, I pray it never happens, that the children of preachers, the children of great men would be the one to create a system and a campaign against God directly. Because they would say, we've been in this system, we've, we've, we've done the pretense for years, claiming and shouting God is good and we've not seen the goodness. We left all to follow him and now we've been behind in everything, cheated, wounded by the pretense and the advocacies that were proposed with no result. Many of you are in that state right now. You love the Lord, but he's still the God of your parents. You have tried to make him your God and it's not worked. That personal relationship, that conviction derived from a personal encounter you've you've tried and you've done all you know to do and all you want to do this is the reason why when people come up with any kind of advocacy believers fall immediately because they were already at the edge of compromise waiting for something to justify their drifting the apostle said but i know whom i have believed and i am persuaded persuaded that he's able to keep that which is committed unto him against that day. Are we together, people of God? So there is a way God designed that men would know him. And it's important for us to follow that pathway. Now, what happens to you when you follow that pathway? I would have to let you see the end picture and then I will guide you through the process. I assure you will be done in no time. Are we together? Because, you see, psychologically, we are motivated by the awareness of how the end looks like. This is how God guides people. This is what supplies the staying power. Are we together? When you want to motivate people to continue, especially if the journey will be difficult, usually you inspire them by giving them an excellent picture of the end. So that even when they are weary, who for the joy that was set before him, is that in your Bible? He despised the same, even for Jesus. So God did not just tell him to die. There was something God told him. There was a joy that was set before him. What was the joy? That he was exalted and given a name, an office, above every other office. Humans thrive on the strength of motivation. Are we together? You have your salary. You have several systems of remuneration, motivations, and all of that. You cannot guide the people indefinitely without giving them a picture of what the end looks like. My question for you, to probe your curiosity, is do you know what God designed that you should look like? If you see the future you now, can you identify it? It is the reason why growth and transformation is slow or wanting because the average believer does not even know what he should become like. What does the future you, what should it look like? What does the prayer warrior, what is the picture of the man of prayer? What is the picture of Esther when she's done? What is the picture of Ruth when she's done? What is the picture of Elijah? What is the picture of Gideon? Are we together? I tell you why people don't go to church again. I tell you why people don't pray again. Because the God of this world has blinded their minds. They have no end picture. They do not know what they will become. There has to be something in front of you. As a student, you have an idea of how a graduate looks like. And so even when you are tired, you remember. And it supplies energy and you keep pressing. Talk to me. Through the rain, through the storm. Do you know how a victorious person looks? Can you paint the picture of victory for me? Can you paint the picture of an anointed woman for me? Can you paint the picture 
of one who has a rich investment of the spirit. Can you paint a picture of revival for me? Do you know what it looks like? Can you paint a picture of God moving within a territory? Do you have that image? Psychologists teach that the mind thinks in pictures. Elementary knowledge, they began to connect words with pictures. That's why you don't forget them. Are we together? So if I say a mango, you have an image. An orange, you have an image. Am I, am I right on that? Yeah. Do you have an image of what revival looks like? Do you have an image of what answered prayer look like? You see that many believers are just randomly rigmaroling through this maze of religion with no definition. It's why so many believers are frustrated. Do you know what success looks like? How do I know I have arrived? How do I know I am becoming? By what standard do I gauge my progress? So that if I'm deviating, I can correct myself. I can't keep moving. You have a GPS system. And whilst you're driving, you keep looking at it to be sure. Are we together? And if for any reason there is a deviation, it recalculates how you get there. And so you find hope that even though I lost my way, I can go back again. Many believers do not even know whether they are right or wrong because there is no reference. Transformation is difficult until there is a reference. You have to know who and what you are becoming like. You have a picture of how a doctor looks like. You have a picture of how a professor looks like. So you can aspire. Are we together? With precision because there is a picture before you. And let me say this respectfully. If you're a man of God here, listen to me. There are many pastors who do not even know. They don't have a picture of how the people they are mentoring should become. How do I know I'm successful? If I'm training you, what are you supposed to become? How do I know I'm making progress? What version of you will satisfy me as a man of God? What version would justify that my training is correct? You never enter a pizza shop as a hospital because there is a design. A pizza does not look like a syringe. No. There's a clear picture. Am I right on that? When you are entering a shop to get a meal, it is so defined that you are not in confusion. You don't have to be educated. The, the parameters are very clear. You can enter a store and know that this is for children. From the paintings to the design, you know that as an adult, there's nothing for you there. Am I right on that? No one enters a hospital to fuel your car. No. Listen, the confusion is because there is no picture of the end. Now, let me give you the picture of the end. I hope, I'm, I'm, I hope God is helping us. I'm trying to be as methodical so that we'll gain something before we depart tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, write this down, please. The end product of God's dealings with men is that we eventually become a manifestation of the glory of Oh, this is powerful. The end product. That means when God begins a journey with a believer, at the back of his training, at the back of his mind, this is what he seeks to make you become. That eventually your life and my life, regardless your background, regardless your past, regardless your failure, that when you begin to walk with God, ladies and gentlemen, please listen. Listen. At the back of God's dealings, at the back of your prayer, your fasting, your study, your coming to church, this is God's goal for you. Not just heaven, as important as that is, but that you become a manifestation of the glory of God. Say God desires, God desires. That, I that I become a manifestation of his, of his glory. Yes, sir. 
That is it. You know what glory is? Glory comes from many expressions, both Greek and Hebrew, but two of them are worthy of note. One is called kabod, the Hebrew, and then the Greek is called doxa. And both of them refer to a system of measuring the worth of a thing. So the word kabod, in its essence, it means wealth or weightiness. It's an attempt to give you a description of the value of a thing by examining the factors that makes that thing valuable. Are we together? So if I pick a phone like this and I say this phone is glorious, to explain the glory of this phone, you have to tell me all the features within the phone that makes it that expensive or that desirable or that valuable. Are we together? So the glory of a thing is a description of the characteristic features that makes that person or that thing worthy of worship. Are we together? Or delightsome or worthy of emulation. The glory of a professor, for instance, is in the years of practice, the intelligence, the order. Are we together now? So if you want to describe the glory of a professor, you would have to tell us the journey that led that professor to that point alongside the awards and all the qualifications. That is the glory of the professor. So when you talk about the glory of God, it means everything that makes God worthy of worship. So his wisdom is an expression of his glory. His favor is an expression of his glory. Am, am, I, am, I, uh, am I communicating? So when God says his goal for you is to become a manifestation of his glory, you know what that means? That means you become a mirror. That anybody who does not know how God looks like, they now study your life. The effulgence of the possibilities of the kingdom that flow through your life become an explanation to men of who God is. Paul simply calls it being a living epistle. You know what a living epistle is? That means your life becomes a continuation of the Bible study of many. That when they close their Bibles, the moment they see you, their Bibles are opened again. Because they are learning dimensions of God. If, 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 if they are praying for favor, God refers them to you as a portrait of what it means to be favored as a portrait of what it means to capture the wisdom of God, as a portrait of what restoration looks like. So when the Bible says, Romans 8:18, it says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, it says, is not worthy to be compared with the glory, hallelujah, with the glory. The temporary constraints of this present time is not worthy to be compared. Boston, listen to me. With the glory which shall be revealed. So there is a glory that shall be revealed in me. I'm saying that for myself. Revealed in me. Hallelujah. Yes. There is a manifestation of the glory of God. Beyond my background. Beyond my yesterday. There is a manifestation of God's glory. Are we together? Yes. The Bible says the earnest expectation, verse 19, of creation awaited the manifestation of the sons of God. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, it says we are his workmanship created in Christ unto good works which God had aforetime a fourth time is a preordination. A fourth time. God is not wondering what to make out of your life. It's been planned already. Did you hear what I said? God is not wondering what to make out of your life. My dear brother, my dear sister. No. In the eons of time, there is already a blueprint. And that the end point of your walk with God is glory. That means until the Holy Spirit sees glory from your life, his assignment is not done. Hmm. Hallelujah. The glory of God. So the Bible says we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had aforetime ordained that we should walk in them. Ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. 
Paul was speaking over the church in Ephesus and he says, Now, to the intent that unto principalities and powers might be made known by the church the manifold, the multifaceted wisdom of God. Hmm. Manifold, the wisdom of God. Are we together? In John chapter 15 and verse 8, here's what Jesus himself said. He said, herein is my father glorified that ye bear much fruit. Say much fruit. So when you bear much fruit, when your life commands results, it brings glory to God. Verse 16 of the same chapter, 15, 16 John, it says, you have not called, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, verse 16 now, that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. I like this. There's a scripture burning in my heart that I want us to shout together. That should be Galatians, is it 120? And they glorified God in me. Hmm. And they glorified God. Please look for it for me. That's Galatians, uh, help me. And they glorified God in me. 120, 24, the last verse, thank you. And they glow. Let this be a prophetic word for someone. That men look at your life and begin to learn God through the lens of your life, the excellence, the glory, the wisdom, the power, the favor that emanates from your life. Men will know for a surety that there is a God that reigns over the affairs of men. It is true. Listen, this is not just this is not just preaching. Believe it. This is your destiny. My destiny is that I will eventually become, in experience, a manifestation of the glory of God. Do not forget this. Your destiny is that you will eventually, not immediately, eventually, as we behold, we are changed. Is that true? As we behold in prayer, we behold in fastings, we behold through the study of God's word, coming to church week in, week out. Sometimes you grow so slow you do not know you are growing until you see the picture of your former self. Then you realize you've grown so much. The baby is not even aware that it is growing. Until you look at the photo and you can see the difference. Even for some of us who have convinced ourselves that we don't change. <laughs> no, look well. Look well. Are we together? Now, my final thoughts and then we'll pray. Thank you, Jesus. There are three phases of every believer's development. This is the apostolic model now that I want to give you. Three phases. And for this, let me request, please, if you will, any three gentlemen, please come. Once we have three, that's fine. It's not an impartation. <laughs> please, you come up here. I want you to stand here. You stand here, that's right. Please come, sir. Just stand with me. Please come, my friend. Okay, you stand at the X-Room, sir. Thank you. And then you stand here. Now, everybody watch this. I'm trying to illustrate for you. I like to preach graphically. People think in pictures. I want to show you the entire journey of the believer from infancy to the place of power, from weakness to the place of strength. There are three phases in every believer's journey. I'm saying this to you because at every point in your Christian experience, you should be able to define where you are in that journey. So as I'm announcing it to you, I'm helping you, I'm giving you a picture so that you will know whether you are behind schedule 
or you will know if you are making progress. Are we together? Now, the foundation for everyone who seeks to be used by God to be a manifestation of God's glory is called salvation. Please say it and write it. Say salvation. salvation. One more time. Salvation. As simple and as basic as this sounds, there are many people roaming around the gates of the kingdom who have not even entered. Proximity to the things of God does not guarantee admission. I hope I'm right if I say there are people who live within the Harvard community but are not students. And they've been there older and longer than the students. They can lead you to any school or faculty you seek, but they are not students. There are people who walk around the airport and they've never flown an aircraft out of their nations. So just because you are around where God is moving, just because you are around church, just because you are around spiritual things does not automatically make you a believer. According to scripture, and we must restore this because there are many people in church who are not saved. That is the real problem. There is a formula for salvation. You don't get salvation. There is an exact spiritual protocol that leads to salvation. And if that experience has not happened, you may be a nice person having a wonderful heart, but you are not saved. I'm not a student of Harvard. I enjoyed a wonderful time roaming around your school, but I'm not. Because a tour around Harvard is not the same as admission. Now, I have pictures of myself in Harvard. You can't change that. Am I right on that? There are many believers who have their pictures near the Holy Spirit, near the Bible, near a pastor, near a revival meeting, near church, but they are not believers. Here's what the Bible says. John chapter 3 and verse 16. Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. John chapter 3 begins, it was a discourse between Jesus and one man, a Pharisee. He had been convicted by the ministry of Jesus, even though he was forced to pretend because he was with his colleagues. Now, he smuggles himself to Jesus by night, and here's what he says. Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher sent from God, he says, for no man can do these miracles which thou doest except God be with him. John chapter 3 now. Verse 3, Jesus now begins to speak and says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Hmm? Then Jesus now says, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The discussion continues until we arrive at verse 16. Jesus is still speaking. For God so loved the world. He proved that he so loved the world by giving his then only begotten son. He's no longer his only begotten son. He's now the first begotten of we, the brethren. Are we together? Anyway, it says that whosoever, I like this. Jesus leaves the, the line blank, whosoever. There are certain things in the Bible that the, the Bible will say he gave on to some. But when it has to do with the business of salvation, it is for whosoever. A drunkard, a prostitute, a bad person, a good person, a self-righteous person, everybody. Whosoever believeth on him, watch this. There is already a verdict from heaven that if you believe in him, as touching his being Savior, Lord, and Christ, that you should not perish, but have life everlasting. I don't want to get into a theological explanation of that word, everlasting life. That was not an accurate translation. It is not everlasting life. It is the Greek word zoe. It is a quality of living beyond everlasting. No. No. It is talking about a kind of life, not just survival indefinitely. Are we together? John would later grow in the spirit 
and in his epistle, he would call it the life of God. Not just everlasting life. Anyway, back to our discussion. So this brother finds himself roaming around the streets of Boston, Cambridge, anywhere around your region. And one day he comes into this beautiful auditorium and he's seated at the back. Then a preacher is preaching, singing, shouting like... And the Spirit of God, because Jesus says, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, the Holy Spirit has a threefold ministry to creation, to unbelievers, and to believers. So the Holy Spirit's assignment is to convict this fellow. Watch this now. So I'm preaching. He's listening to me. I'm talking about the life of God. A beautiful presentation. I'm giving a manifesto of what God wants to make out of his life. Are we together? And whilst I'm speaking through the frailty of my speech, the Spirit of God is riding through his heart. And I make what we know to be an altar call, a proposition. Are we together? The first sermon that was preached in the book of Acts was by Peter. And Peter made a profound statement. He said, let it be known to you, O Israel, that the same Jesus who you have crucified has today been exalted as Lord and Christ. It is not every information about Jesus that translates to salvation. Believing Jesus came from God is not what saves you. No. There is an exact information. Believing Jesus was a good man does not give you salvation. <laughs> Believing Jesus lived a sinless life is true, but does not give you salvation. There is an exact information. You must believe his substitutionary sacrifice. You must believe that he died and was buried and that he resurrected by the glory of the Father. You must believe that he paid the penalty of your sin. Are we together? And the Bible says in believing that report, you receive the honor of his life. There is no other name under heaven, the Bible declares, given unto men. I'm saying this because most people in church are around the things of God, they, but they have not made this declaration. So we're trying to use counseling and therapy, as wonderful as that is. I don't reject that. But let me tell you, nothing will be a replacement for a genuine encounter with Jesus. So there are many problems that plague people in our world and our churches today. It is because they are alienated from the life of God. There is no amount. The demons that afflict them will step out while you are counseling them and wait for them to cry out their lives and get back because they have a legitimate access. And you believe what you are hearing. The Bible calls an encounter with Jesus a translation from the kingdom of darkness. Do you believe the Bible? To the kingdom of God's dear son. God's dear son. Now, as ordinary as that confession is, there is a miracle happening in the spirit. So you declare that Jesus is Lord. The protocol, the formula for administering salvation is found in Romans chapter 10 from verse 9 and 10. Please do not forget this for the rest of your life. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, someone say with thy mouth. With thy mouth. No assumption. Your mouth has a role to play. It is a declaration of your inadequacy. Are we together? Salvation is never administered to the arrogant and the self-righteous. This is why your mouth has to verbalize your need for God. No assumptions. God made us free moral agents. He will not usurp on your will. Even at the detriment of your eternal destiny, you can choose to ignore him and he will respect your choice. So this man confesses the lordship of jesus and does that believing in his heart that god raised him from the dead the bible says you shall be saved no matter the past whether you feel anything or don't feel and it is not a feeling it's a spiritual reality and let me tell you this 
if any one of you under the sound of my voice has gone through that state where you came to a point of an awareness of your inadequacy outside of Christ and you verbalize it by declaring his lordship, I want you to know whether you feel it or not, based on the authority of scripture, you are saved. You may not cry and shout and roll on the floor, but the truth of scripture still remains the truth. And no matter how you, you can fall under the anointing and you are still not saved. Falling under the anointing does not mean you are saved. It is the effect of the power of God within your circumference. That is not salvation. Are we together? Receiving it, I can pray for an, everybody Jesus prayed for to be healed was an unbeliever. Nobody could believe until he resurrected from the dead. But everybody Jesus healed still died. Everybody Jesus fed still died. They didn't have the life of life. Are we together? Now, so this gentleman gets saved. That's the first phase. Salvation. Do not forget this. The greatest need of an unbeliever is salvation. Anytime you see an unbeliever, you can feed them, you can counsel them, you can love them, but just know that the greatest need from a spiritual standpoint, my dear people, anytime you see an unbeliever anywhere, that may be your spouse with all due respect, maybe your children, maybe well-meaning people, colleagues in your office, students, the moment you see an unbeliever, I want you to know that no matter what you do, give, say, the greatest need of every unbeliever from an eternal standpoint and from a spiritual standpoint is salvation. If I feed you, my dear brother, if I clothe you, that is wonderful, expected of a Christian, but you will still go to hell. Many of you are seated right now listening to me and there are wonderful people you've been kind to but they are on their way to hell. Yes, sir. I hate being a bearer of bad news and I wish it were a lie but it is true. Spouses going to hell. Children going to hell. Sincere people who greet you smiling at you. And you feel so warm when they smile, but they are still going to hell. Grandparents going to hell. Maybe beautiful, intelligent Harvard students going to hell. Many people roaming around the streets of Cambridge, Massachusetts, Boston, going to hell. There were people who woke up on earth this morning, but they are in hell right now. The greatest need of an unbeliever is not welfare. The greatest need of an unbeliever, ladies and gentlemen, an unbeliever meaning one who has not declared the lordship of Christ. Again, I say, it's not about being good or bad. If you do not have Jesus in your heart, you are called an unbeliever. Not necessarily a sinner, but an unbeliever. So, this gentleman, upon declaring the Lordship of Christ, he has passed the first gate. Profitably so. But to summarize quickly so that we'll wrap up for tonight. If this gentleman remains this way, he is saved, but he is going to become a frustrated, ineffective believer. Did you get what I said? Is he saved? Genuinely so? Yes. Has he met Jesus? Yes. But you see, the profit of the life that he has received cannot be enjoyed at this level. This is the challenge with many Christians. They are saved. But the Bible says an heir for as long as he's a child. Same attack an unbeliever is having, he's still having it. Same problems, same weaknesses, same addictions. Come on now. Same whatever. To the point that the gentleman 
looks at his former self through the window and cannot see the difference because he was just a step away, even though a translation. Now, most believers have not been mentored into understanding that surrendering your life, receiving the life of Jesus is the beginning of the journey, not the end of it. So they get saved and they're angry, wondering, what is wrong with my life? Demons do not seem to respect my confession of Jesus. Absolutely. That leads to the next phase. The next phase is called transformation. This is the next phase. It is at the point of transformation that the riches of eternal life begin to manifest experientially. Look, this is the destiny of this man. Watch this. Remember my teaching? That your prophetic destiny, your preordination, have you forgotten? Is that you eventually become the glory of God. This is the future self of that man right there. That weak man. That prayerless man. That man who does not love the things of God. Literally struggled his way. Yet, that is still his destiny. He will go to bed and see that prophet. He would go to bed and see that evangelist. He would go to bed and see that world changer. You see, there is still a long distance between the future him and the current him. Now watch this. When God wants to help this man, there are three things he introduces to his life. Please do not forget. It is the arrival of these three forces that translates this one from a saved believer to a transformed believer. Number one, the word of God. Number two, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Number three, the ministry of a teaching priest. Please take note. These tripartite ministries or forces are responsible for transiting this believer from an ordinary weak believer, full of God's life, but never having an experience of the same. Again, the word of God. Are we together? God grants you access to the word of God. But the word of God without the ministry of the teaching priest will not profit you. Because it must be line upon line. Precept upon precept. Your transformation must be methodical. Let me tell you this. Honestly, if God puts before you a... a, a um, a true shepherd. Huh? Someone to mentor you and to guide you. I want you to know that she showed you love and kindness. If you fall into a wrong church, a wrong hand, that complicates this process. There are many believers who as soon as they got saved, it was a wrong hand that received them. And so for the next 10 years, it was a journey of total waste, confusion, got into practices. And after 10 years, looking at themselves now, they are still saved. Saved for 20 years. But the wrong hand. Maybe I'm describing someone right now. If only you had a teaching priest indeed. One year under constructive, methodical mentorship, you would have become a wonder by now. Anyway, so he grants you the word, say the word. the word. Then the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then number three, the ministry of a teaching priest. Listen, I'm giving you this spiritual education so that you can leave this place and know exactly what the challenge is with any believer. When someone tells you, you know, I, I'm saved, I'm not growing. Aha, you can fill in the blanks. You can tell the person with, the, the, is with surgical precision, I know what is wrong with you. You do not have access to the word. You are not truly enjoying the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And ultimately, I see that you lack the ministry of a teaching priest. This is why we invite people to church. We do not just invite people to church because we are looking for crowds and membership. It's our partnership with the Holy Spirit to bring these kinds of people 
and those before them so that they can get to this place. That means if you do not participate in in gathering and soul winning, you are doing heaven a disservice. I was glad when they said unto me, let us, not let me, let us, let us, let us, let us, as for me and my house, how will they serve the Lord until they are, they are taught the ways of the Lord? So now, this man is fortunate to meet a teaching priest and using scripture in partnership with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, I begin to mentor this weak man. I show him that prayer can transit men. I submit him to the ministry of prayer, guiding him to a system that is already predefined. This man starts to pray. The weak man begins to be strong. The man who knew no scripture, you see that now? That prayer ministry, he is under constructive mentorship. So I am guiding him. He learns the value of service as he sits under this anointing week in, week out. After one year, you look for that former gentleman, you don't find him again. He's not here, but he's not there. He's shifted. Give this man three years and he's moved. You look at him and say, I was in your church when you were saved. And he says, you're right, but that was the former me. This one has grown, Ephesians 4, 18, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their minds. So the teaching priest has worked in partnership with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, introducing him to the various facets of the kingdom life, building his understanding. Now he knows the value of prayer. He prays at home and in church. He knows the value of service. He's not just a member, he has become a worker. You see that now? He knows the value of fasting. He understands the value of consecration. Are you seeing that now? Yes. He understands the value of transformation. When this man is given a gift of $100, he doesn't run around just to buy clothes. He would go to a bookstore and get quality Christian materials because he's been mentored to see the value of a transformed mind. Now, eventually, he arrives here. We're wrapping up. Great journey so far. So, when he gets here, he begins to see the manifestation of the life of God. He begins to see certain things happen in his life. But even this is not all. There is one more face. This face is called empowerment. So, salvation, transformation, empowerment. Let me tell you what most believers do. From here, they want to jump through an impartation. Sorry to have to drag you, my friend. Are we together? So once they see a man of God, they quickly get on their knees and say, you know what? It doesn't matter how transformed I just got saved. You just do whatever you have to do on my head. And they believe that they've been... No, it doesn't work that way. There are no jumping classes in the spirit. Salvation, the greatest need of a transformed believer is the grace to validate the things you now know. These talks of encounter that gives you salvation, these talks of the inner workings of the spirit, at this point you are knowledgeable, but you need grace to defend the things you know. This man is in ignorance. This one has knowledge, but the knowledge may not have proof. So you need empowerment. This is the model Jesus had with the disciples. At this point, he said, tarry ye in Jerusalem. I spent three years teaching you, but that does not qualify you to go and represent me. But look at the ratio of impartation to transformation. And I submit to you, this is one challenge with the Pentecostal charismatic circle. We do not place premium on transformation. Jesus spent three and a half years of constructive mentorship to one night of encounter with the Spirit. 
Don't rush to lay hands on people. Don't rush to just minister to people. Bring them to a point. The value of empowerment is when the grace comes on a transformed mind. The oil always assumes the shape of the vessel. The challenge with the wife of the prophet was not the potential of the oil, but the vessel that was hosting the oil made it small. And the prophet said, go and borrow vessels. You can't borrow oil, but you can borrow vessels. And he says, in borrowing, borrow not a few. Expand your capacity, and the oil will look like the chains do. Two people can be anointed, same grace, but limited in their operation because, for one, the grace comes upon a mindset that is not transformed, and you would not see the potential of that anointing. That same anointing will come upon another person, are we together? And on the strength of his or her transformation, you would see that the person will move in power. There are many of our fathers who did not have secular enlightenment nor proper mentorship, but by their press through prayer and fasting, they access certain graces. And you would see that they were so anointed, but the potential of that anointing was boxed through a low-level transformation. If that same anointing comes upon another person who spends time building capacity, that's when you see the kind of anointing they imparted on you. When God delays in anointing you, it's not demonic. He's giving you room to expand so that when that grace comes, the full potential of what that anointing carries, are we together now, will be made visible. So, the greatest need of a transformed believer is empowerment. This man, the difference between this man and this man is not necessarily knowledge is that this one has received the engracing. It is at the point of empowerment you change from being a believer to a witness. We'll take it from there tomorrow. This is where I'll find a place to stop here. God's goal is not for you to remain a believer. You start by being a believer, and in addition to being a believer, you graduate to a witness. Your real relevance in the kingdom it's not when you are a believer. Your real relevance to God and to your world is when you become a witness. In the book of Revelations, Jesus was not just a believer. He was called a faithful witness. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, You shall receive the Holy Ghost, power after the Holy Ghost is come, and you shall be not preachers, not students, not witnesses. Tomorrow we'll teach on this. The ones that God is looking for are not just born-again Christians. The ones that God is looking for are not just believers. God is looking for witnesses. A witness is a matured believer who has transited to a point where he can assume kingdom responsibility, representing the purposes of God and defending the interests of the kingdom. It is at that point the glory of God is revealed in you. Are we together? So at any given point in church, you will always find these three groups of people. In fact, four. There are those who are outside. <laughs> you need to know that as a man of God so you don't assume. Then the ordinary believer who just came to church will laugh at people praying. He doesn't care. Don't be angry. That's why he's there. And then you transit that person methodically, patiently. He becomes an enlightened believer. Then you introduce, if all you know is doctrine and you do not have power, this is where you will stop people. You can't go further. Because the power of the Holy Spirit will have to continue the journey. Doctrine is profitable, but without power, people will stop here. So you will gather a lot of intellectuals making arguments, propositions without the capacity to make manifest the things they know. God is good. I know the scripture. You are right. It's here, but not here. 
God heals. I can tell you, Mark chapter this, verse this, I've been properly taught. I know what prayer does. Prayer, we can intercede. There are all kinds of spirits. There are principalities. There are powers. You've been well mentored. But unfortunately, you will become so frustrated because you are full of light and the grace that will release it to you and your world has not come. So many of us are here right now full of light. Something in you wants to break out. But the capacity, and if you attempt to do what this man is doing here, you will be disappointed. The disciples were in training. One time they couldn't wait again. And they went to a, an epileptic patient. Remember, left disappointed and pain and said, no, come on. They knew about healing, but it was not just knowledge. They needed something else. But when that grace came upon them, the shadow of Peter, handkerchiefs and aprons were taken from Peter. Then you get here, empowered believer, a witness. I will leave you until we get tomorrow. I will show you that beyond here, there is also one more step. Because there is something you must know to remain empowered. Empowerment is very sensitive. You can lose many things. Because with the coming of the anointing upon your life will come many other things. Pride, complacency. There is a skill to remaining at this realm. Your relevance does not just depend on your arriving here, but your remaining there. There are many people who began to die when they got here. Because at this point, you are called a celebrity. Joshua Selman. Now the world knows you. Whether you pray or not. At this point, you have some credibility. There is a kind of temptation that only comes when you are here. You will never know that there is such a reality. Listen. If you know this, you will know why God mandates to pray for all leaders. There are certain attacks that never happened here. Never happened here. Satan will be patient even, even if it's after 20 years. Please do not miss tomorrow. Because among the things I will be teaching you is the dynamics of warfare. I will show you how great men remain here. And how territories are taken. Hallelujah. Watch this. This man cannot save Boston. No. No. He will only keep having dreams of a revival coming. This one will be the one who will be pointing at people and saying, look, don't worry, a move is coming. He's right. <laughs> but it will never happen. I know a move is coming. He's not wrong. But this man is the one that God can come to and say, I want to deliver Boston to your hand. Can I trust you for the next three years with my program? Please rise up. Don't be distracted. We're about to pray. There are three levels of authority in the Bible that can be given to believers. Gentlemen, I'm grateful. Thank you. There are three levels of authority. Please listen. This will be my final thought with us. Number one, the, when you begin to walk with God, the least level of authority you receive is authority over things. Hmm. The things that we clamor for are wonderful, but when you have authority over things like money, like property, it's wonderful, but you don't really weigh much in the spirit. It is the least level of spiritual authority. Authority over things. Hallelujah. The next level of authority you can walk in is authority over territories. When God increases your ranking in the spirit, you are given access. Your sphere of influence is enlarged. So that your apostolic reach extends to territories. You speak from one place, but the reaction happens in several places. It's growth in the spirit. 
the highest level of authority as recorded from scripture that an individual can have is the authority that God gives you to steward his program. Do you know what that means? So God says, because you have been faithful, I have a goal in my heart that in the next five years, I want to turn Boston, I want to turn Cambridge to become like Azusa State. So you are the one. Listen, God will use everybody, but he does not start with everybody. He will come to one person and say, can I trust you? You have demonstrated faithfulness. I want to place grace. You will not be the one to do the work alone, but that program is given to you. The first thing God gave the people in the parable of the talent were talents. The talents were things, but they were a test. The goal was not the talent. Their faithfulness, one of the synoptic accounts will say, you have been faithful with little. I will make you ruler. And they were given territories. But the highest level of authority a believer can demonstrate in this side of God's kingdom is to be trusted with a portion of God's kingdom come project. This is what was done with Paul. Paul did not just have authority over things and over territories, but he was literally given the apostolic ministry to the Gentiles. Peter was given to the Jews. None of the disciples and apostles had the encounter that was documented in the book of Revelation. Only one person, John the Beloved. And John was told in heaven, write. Paul was told to write. Peter was told to write. Those who get to that realm of authority over God's program are the ones who write. They write for generations to come. They have earned a status in the spirit where God would tell them you cannot die with what you have. Right? They are given the grace to mentor people. You are in this place right now and thank you for, the, for being patient. I know I've stretched you a bit. We're wrapping up. But this is a build up to a very weighty discussion we're going to have tomorrow. I'll be praying over the sick, prophesying and imparting grace upon you. But impartation is useless until this build-up is there. For many of you, by what you have received now, you are almost saying, have I been a Christian at all? Don't be discouraged. It is important to provoke one another unto godliness. Not to create an offense, but to challenge you. Some of you will go back home and sit down and say, my God, what have I been doing? That is a very good state because now the Holy Spirit can come. Revival don't, don't just come because you see it coming. No. If you have not met Jesus Christ, you are even outside. If you have met him and you have refused to be transformed, I don't care about church. I don't care about any pastor. I don't care about anyone. That understanding is an attack. That state of thinking itself is an attack attempted to rob you from your spiritual transition to a place where you become a transformed believer. And then if you are transformed, having, the Bible says, ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth, knowledge can puff up. And there are many people who come here and talk about what God can do that never gets done through them. Then you come to this realm. Some of you, by grace and by mercy, you are here right now this third phase but there is a unique attack and the dynamics of living at this realm some of you did not even last there every kind of thing from carnality to pride to flesh to lust to self-righteousness to feeling you are better than everybody and that has already destroyed the potential of your manifestation because at this point you will have money you will have influence. Everybody will like you. The devil will send all kinds of people to your life. If you do not understand the intelligence, this is where great revivalists died. Because they were not mentored. Some of them had lonely paths. They didn't know how to preserve the oil. 
this was the tragedy of Samson. Please pray in one minute. Lord, I am available. Use me. Use me. Whether you came here to study and you're returning back to your nation or you are here permanently in America, those who are following online, please join us as we pray. We've been discussing matters of the move of God. Please take a minute to pray. Pray. I'm available. I desire that transition in the spirit from an ordinary believer, void of knowledge, void of passion, to a transformed believer, full of light, through the ministry of the word, through the ministry of prayer, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, through the ministry of a teaching priest. And then for some of you, you have encompassed this mountain of transformation long enough. It's time to move to a realm of empowerment where you become demonstrators of his life and power, his healing, his wisdom, where you can be used, given mandates over territories. One minute in prayer and then we're done. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. If you look at my shirt, you will see a very bold statement written there. Jesus revealed, Jesus glorified. This is one of the biggest secrets of remaining human. When it becomes about you and you fall prey to the deception of celebrity living, you are done. Great men remain because they live to make him great. Great men remain because like John, they are not ashamed to decrease. Even if it stings their ego, they rather be forgotten and he be remembered through their life. I can tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. Tomorrow I hope I'll tell you a bit about my story. Please come early. If there is one secret about the life of this man you see standing before you, behind every great thing you have heard, Revive us across the nations to the glory of God. This is it. This is the central governing creed, the theme of my life. This is why I live. Jesus revealed through my life. Jesus glorified through my life. And if I be lifted up, I will draw them. If you can hide behind the cross and get out of the way, there is a man of power that can rise from you. There is a world changer that can rise from you. There is a revivalist that can rise from you. Let this be your final prayer tonight. Lord, let me decrease that Jesus will increase. Please go ahead and pray. Every flesh every search for vain glory i'm not saying you will not be lifted i'm not saying you will not be glorified but to truly become a manifestation of the glory of god you must die to self die to self the price for all of god is all of you the price for all of god is all of you the price for all of God is all of you. Hallelujah. Amen. Now please, let me make one final altar call and I'm out of your face for tonight. I never end a meeting like this, making assumptions as far as salvation is concerned. You are in this place tonight or across any expressions, if there are any overflows, but particularly 
for those who are connected from across the globe here in America, Europe, Africa. You heard me teach. And whilst I was teaching, the Spirit of God who convicts men was speaking to your heart that you have to win that war once and for all. You see, the things about God or the, about the kingdom is that you are never compelled, forced against your will to do anything. This is the difference between the Holy Spirit and a demon spirit. Behold, I stand. I created you, but I'm not ashamed to stand and knock. If you reject me, I will respect you, even to the detriment of your eternal destiny. You are in this place, no assumptions. You are saying, Apostle, if you will give me an opportunity, I truly, genuinely, unashamedly want to make Jesus Lord of my life. That includes those who are connecting from across the globe, following by television, following by the internet. And for those people, I want to steal out a minute and leave you to make this prayer. If you belong to any of those categories, or you are saying, Apostle, I truly want to rededicate my life genuinely. May I please request, boldly, unashamedly, please leave your seat and come and stand here. I'll just count three. Don't leave anyone. Don't be ashamed. Don't say there's someone watching me. No, this is, this is a business of destiny. Is there any such persons? Please make your way here. I'll count three and we begin to pray. Thank you. One. Let's bless them. Go ahead. Bless them. Come. Come. Thank you. Come. Thank you. Come. It's a new season for you. Come. Come. God bless you. For the sake of your children, come. For the sake of the destinies connected to you, our Father is coming. Let's bless God for him. Come. 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 You're never too old to meet with Jesus. You're never too young to meet with Jesus. Come. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for the boldness to walk up here declaring the Lordship of Jesus over your life. I want you to see yourself as one who has been called to receive an award except that this surpasses any and every kind of award you will get. <laughs> Awards are for people deserving, but the life of God is for people undeserving, beginning from us to everyone here. And so thank you very much for this. May I lead you to make this declaration of faith, and I want you to know that even though you are here in the midst of God's people, I want you to just see Jesus standing in front of you, loving you with his arms open, telling you it doesn't matter what you've done or not done, he's able to give you a new beginning. Lift your right hand, let me request, please. And I want you to say this as loud and as clear as you can. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight I have heard your word. I love you with all my heart. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose again for my justification. Right now, I receive Jesus into my heart. Be my Savior, my Lord, and my King. I declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over my life. I'm a child of God. I live victorious from tonight and forever. Amen. Keep your wonderful hands lifted. Father, thank you.
The Bible declares that as many who will come to you, you will in no wise cast away. These lovely, beautiful, and precious people have come declaring your lordship over their lives. Let the grace that saves rest upon you. And I pray, I commend you to the ministry of the word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you begin to walk in victory even beginning from today. Madam, look at me. The power of God is coming on you. I decree and declare, I just saw something tying you in the name of Jesus. I release you from it now. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are released forever by the power of the Holy Spirit, never to be a victim of this again. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Now, very quickly, there is a, a form here. I'm sure that uh, maybe the counselors, they will just hand it over to you whilst you're back to your seats. Will that be fine? Okay. Okay, beautiful. So you, if you see any of them, please pick the form, fill it clearly, and then I'm sure that there's a group that will meet with you just to follow up. Please do cooperate with them. God bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. So please make sure you pick the form on your way back to your seat. Okay. Anyone wearing the, I see welcome home, is that it? So just look for those who have the welcome home and then um, please make sure you pick and then return back to your seat in Jesus' name. Amen. What time are we here tomorrow? Someone help me. 5.45. Okay, so please, um, let's come early so that we can take some time. Come tomorrow, prepare to pray. In fact, once you come, just begin to pray before we come. Uh, find a corner and just begin to pray your heart. Number two, let me request at the permission of the organizers, how many of you believe that God answers prayer? Now, I want to give you an instruction in righteousness. Write down everything that needs to end in your life. And I want you to come with it tomorrow as an act of faith. Now, there are many who could not make it. Please do well to extend. Let them send their request. Even though they are not here, some of them are your loved ones. Sadly, they may not have the space. Um, perhaps the organizers, can you make a provision for people to send in their requests so that we collate it and pray and just speak life over your situations? I believe that age-long captivities will come to an end finally. But for tonight, may God bless you. May God honor you in the name of Jesus. I release the grace for encounters tonight. You return back to the realm of visions, the realm of dreams, supernatural encounters in Jesus' name. Bishop, thank you again. Truly grateful. Thank you. Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. Do not keep the video to yourself. Share to as many as you can to help them bless. Check our homepage for more of our messages. Subscribe to the channel. Comment on it. Like it. See you on our next video. Bye. Pray. Pray. Pray for your destiny. The phase of development. Lord, grant me the discipline.